Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wandering in Darkness. I apologize for the delay. Things have been pretty crazy this summer. A quick side note before we jump into things. The Roundtable podcast is still planned. We got together. Uh, recording didn't really work, so we're going to try to rent a place and go ahead with that. But uh, we'll see how long that takes. You know, it's hard to organize a lot of people these days. Anyways, today we're going to look at reasons polytheism is superior to monotheism and why monotheism itself is more than likely false. There are two reasons why polytheism is more reasonable form of theism than monotheism. First is that it addresses all the same questions on mono as monotheism. And second is that it does not fall victim to the logical, evidential, pragmatic, and cultural flaws of monotheism. Today, I just want to discuss some of these, the bigger examples of why. Polytheism is the belief in many gods. It can take many forms, but for the purposes of this episode, I'll simply focus on my own perspective at this time. It is my belief that there's a single, large pantheon of deities, some of whom have interacted with humanity throughout our history in greatly varying ways. Rather than a view in which the Roman, Greek, and Egyptian pantheons would be seen as distinct from each other and housing completely different deities, I instead believe that these cultural differences are just due to our interpretations of the gods. It makes sense to me that we would interpret the gods differently based on geography, economy, cultural values, and so forth. This is comparable to how all cultures have been looking at the same stars, but coming up with different constellations, and yet the stars still objectively exist. Our ancestors seem to have felt the same way. For instance, the gods Set and Baal were seen as the same deity with different names in their respective cultures, and there were many such crossovers across many different pantheons, such as Egypt and Greece, Greece and Rome, and so on. In polytheism, the gods do not tend to be all loving or, or all powerful, and most of them do not pretend otherwise. While some cases may find the polytheist in a master-slave type relationship with their deity, this is rare, especially in the modern day. It is also important to clarify that the gods do not equate to natural phenomenon. Few to know polytheists believe storms are caused by deities, especially in the 21st century. It is likely that the priests of the ancient world did not even believe this in the most literal, limiting sense. This means that when people react to polytheism with a laugh and comment about how we know that how lightning works or wind works or something like that, they are creating a straw man and nothing less. Such natural forces as storms or anything like that are simply symbols of the gods and their natures. It's like if I describe a friend as having a fiery personality, I am using fire symbolically to describe them, not suggesting that my friend is the source of all fires. In most myths, there have been a god or two that wanted all the power for themselves, wanted all the other gods to bow before them, such as Osiris in Egypt or Zeus in Greece. Starting in the 18th dynasty, one of these gods, calling itself the Aten, and its followers, said Aten was the only god and tried to destroy polytheism, but the Egyptians rejected this outright. However, given a few more centuries, monotheism took over Western culture, and all the polytheistic deities were bastardized into demons and devils, some being equated with Satan himself. There's absolutely no truth to these demonizations. Now, to compare polytheism to monotheism, let's start with divine experiences, contradictory religious texts, and mutually exclusive religious traditions. Divine experiences, an individual having an interaction with a deity or mystical force, have been reported in virtually all times and cultures, up to and through the modern day. This common human experience is some of the strongest evidence for the existence of gods, for we cannot possibly assume or show that they were all independent hallucinations or otherwise invalid. And even when we do show that an individual divine experience might be invalid, it does not imply they all are. For instance, pain is another common human experience, and it can be imagined or fake, but this does not mean that pain is invalid in every single instance where it was, is reported. And indeed, we are right to give claims of pain the benefit of the doubt until we have reason to believe otherwise in individual cases. It's the same for divine experience. This commonality of divine experience shows that belief in polytheism is valid, though this in no way is meant to prove it is true in some metaphysical sense. It's simply logically valid, like the conclusion follows from the evidence. Indeed, experience is one of the most common reasons people reject atheism in my experience. However, there's a catch for the monotheist when it comes to divine experience. Arguing that the experience of only their God is valid, but others are not, is special pleading. If experiencing Yahweh or Christ is valid for belief in those beings, experiencing other gods makes polytheism just as reasonable. And people have reported far more than one deity across history. A monotheist may try to argue that these gods that others experience are demons or jinn or some other such thing, but that opens up the possibility that their own god is one such entity. If their god is the sole exception to the possibility of being evil, 
it is again special pleading. Contradictory religious texts, mutually exclusive spiritual traditions, one must also special plead to write these things off. If there are many, many gods, then the existence of many, even contradictory religious traditions and texts is nothing but expected. Such a scripture can also easily be understood as a single viewpoint, viewpoint or a piece of a greater puzzle, colored by bias rather than an ultimate flawless truth. Different afterlives, differing near-death experiences, these can also be explained in theism with the existence of multiple gods, and with our afterlife differing based on one's gods or one's path. Again, to only say experiences of your own religious afterlives or near-death experiences are valid, like heaven and hell, is fallacious. It doesn't work at all. A major problem atheists often and correctly bring up for monotheism is how many different religions there are. Wouldn't an all-powerful, all-loving God, who desires we all believe in him, simply prove himself to the world at large? How can there be a God when there are so many different reports of what that God is, what it wants, and so forth? The solution is easy. There are many limited gods with differing values, wills, and so on. While this is a good argument against monotheism, it is an argument for polytheism as well, going back to the inability to invalidate divine experience. Moving on, the problem of evil says that if there is one all-loving, all-powerful deity, we should not expect evil in the world. This is because evil would imply the deity either allows evil while being able to stop it, so is not all-loving, or the deity wishes it could stop evil but cannot do so, it is not all-powerful. The problem is that evil clearly exists, as does a god or gods with many traditions claiming they are the one monotheistic omni-god. The only reasonable conclusion for the theist here is since evil is real, is that any deity claiming to be omni is lying, or its followers are lying on its behalf. Either way, this is not a good thing. It is also important to note polytheistic gods are not omni, even if they claim to be, and thus do not fall victim to the problem of evil. Of course, monotheists believe there are solutions to this problem of evil. One is that we simply cannot see God's big picture for us with our limited minds, and so cannot understand the benefits of our suffering. Of course, this is akin to an abusive parent who believes they are building character in their child via abuse, but the child simply doesn't understand. They can't comprehend how these beatings and degradings and such are going to make them a stronger person, supposedly. Obviously, this is disturbing, absurd, and dangerous, and it's an, a slippery slope. We do not want to follow the idea that maybe abusing someone is okay just because you don't understand why that abuse is happening. Another attempted solution is to suggest that evil only exists because of humanity's actions in the Garden of Evil, the so-called fall of man. Taking that story as true, this means that with, with full fore, foreknowledge of us sinning and having to suffer evil, God allowed the fall to happen to us forever for whatever reason. This just brings it back around to God's plate. Why would he even allow us to fall at all? Why plant the tree? Why make eating from the tree a sin? Why not just make us... Able of understanding good and evil from the start, why allow the serpent into the garden? What does he get out of it besides forcing worship out of followers in favor of salvation, which does not seem all good and loving at all? And why does evil impact other non-human life when they were not responsible for the fall? Let's put this fall of man story in more everyday terms. Take a firefighter who commits arson in order to put out the fire and appear the hero. Even if he does save people and get the fire out, is he really a moral hero? hero when he started the fire in the first place? Does the act of putting out the fire undo his act of causing it? And what if people are hurt in the fire? What if they suffer in this fire that the firefighter unnecessarily caused just so he could put it out? Wouldn't he be an even greater villain? What Yahweh claims to have done is this on an infinitely greater scale, throwing us into a fire that he started and making us beg him to put it out. Likewise, another example is to take a police officer who knows a man wants to torture and kill you, knows who and where the man is, when they are going to attack you, and everything about the case. Instead of stopping the man, however, the police tell you that for every month you donate to the station and praise it on social media, they will protect you. But the month you stop, they will let the criminal torture and kill you. Nobody in their right mind would believe these officers were moral or upholding the law. And yet the situation between Yahweh and the so-called devil and monotheism is identical just on a much more massive and therefore ter terrible scale. According to him and his followers, he knows the suffering that will happen and the evil Satan will inflict, and he can stop it, but he will only assist when you give him offering and worship. It's very messed up. A third supposed solution is to say that evil is worth the existence of free will, as we are allowed to decide for ourselves who we will be and what we will do. 
This implies God could not or simply did not create a world where both free will and no evil exist, once again proving he is not omni, and thus proving he is dishonest about his nature. It must also be noted that in this God's own mythology, gaining free will and knowledge in the Garden of Eden was a sin so horrible that it damned both us and the serpent for all eternity, showing that free will for humanity clearly is not very high on the priority list of such a God. Further, it seems important to add here that there is no true freedom of will if the only options are A and B, and B is unending suffering and torture. Now, what if the reward for enduring the suffering is worth it all? Sure, you may have been used, abused, assaulted, hung out to dry, but it was only during a temporal life, and now you have an eternity of peace. The first issue is that the all-powerful and all-loving God would never have had to create or allow for suffering in the first place. Even then, I disagree that any reward is worth serious trauma. I would be hesitant to trust or respect anyone who writes off things like child abuse, poverty, or sexual violence, simply because they are not eternal. In a perfect world, these things should not happen even for a moment. We also know in modern psychology that even abuse solely in one's early years will have lifelong effects. There's no reason to think that more time would solve the problem. The only way to undo such trauma would be to erase it from memory, and then what was the point of it in the first place? So, perhaps God is simply bound to logic, which explains his seeming lack of power in certain situations. This is often argued by monotheism, such as when posed with a question like, could God create a rock so heavy he couldn't lift it? If he can, then God cannot do everything because he can't lift the rock. If he can't, then God also cannot do everything because he cannot create the rock. So they might say the question is invalid because the scenario, scenario requires violating logic. The issue here is rather clear, though. If God cannot supersede logic, he is again not omnipotent. He, it also means he didn't create logic. He's bound to it. So what he's telling us about himself cannot be the truth. One last point related to this problem of evil is divine hiddenness, that the supposedly all-powerful and all-living God is said to desire a relationship with us, which is to our benefit, and which, if we don't engage in, will cause great eternal suffering. But then he doesn't prove himself to the world at large. Which, with limited gods that are not omni, this is no problem. You see, if you reach out to Yahweh for a relationship and there's no answer, it causes a whole slew of problems when you're then punished for not believing. But if you reach out to, say, a Norse or Egyptian god and they do not answer, perhaps they're busy. Perhaps they just don't care. Perhaps they outright don't like you and aren't interested in that relationship. So if nothing else is convincing among all these arguments... At least let the problem of evil show that omni-monotheism is refuted, invalid, and unsound. It should be abandoned as much as physicalism, creationism, and flat earth theory. Moving on, two related refutations of monotheism are that it is this all-loving and all-powerful God seems to play favorites, and that God's chosen people can be harmed. Why would an all-powerful and all-loving God fight on the side of one people against others if he is God of all? Why would he even need to if he could just avoid wars and hatred and stuff like that? This is even more confusing when a deity says something like murder is immoral, then turns around to condone the murder of heretics or even do it themselves. If God is indeed all-powerful and all-loving, and he has a favored people, why would those people be undergoing persecution or genocide? Why in the Bible, which is supposed to be God's own word, are there instances of other people and other gods being victorious over his people? What of the very real persecution of monotheists that have occurred over the centuries against his chosen people, such as the Holocaust? It makes no sense for any of these things to happen, let alone be in scripture, if God is really all-loving and all-powerful and all-intelligent, because why would you write yourself to be so flawed, you know? In the case of polytheism, the question is answered easily. There are many gods with many wills, and they're not all-powerful and not even all-loving. So some gods probably cared very much about these types of persecutions, but weren't able to stop it. Maybe some gods didn't. I, the possibility of evil gods is one that we should seriously consider, in my opinion. Next, if one believes in the first, if one believes that the first cause of the universe, per the cosmological argument, is a deity, this can be answered by both a polytheistic pantheon and a monotheistic god. When one posits a god as the first cause, an obvious question is which god. Nothing about the cosmological argument suggests that this must be the god known as Yahweh or Allah who is in charge. It's actually more reasonable to believe a polytheistic pantheon is responsible for the first cause, as reality is not uniform, it is, it is, it is um, it's imperfect. Sorry, sorry, I can't get my words out apparently, but reality is not uniform and imperfect. 
It's even possible that there is a first cause, but that it's not a deity at all, such as it being a Big Bang or a random generation from quantum foam. The same applies to teleological arguments, like the watchmaker argument, which say that conditions for life are so specific, a god must have been involved in designing the world. Sure, if nature was different, life as we know it may not exist, but this does not necessarily imply a god is responsible, and even if it does, it doesn't imply one specific deity of all the deities out there. The lack of uniformity in life and imperfection in the world is once again better answered here by polytheism than monotheism, and for the same reasons. So the first cause and watchmaker arguments don't support monotheism at all, even if they're true. Now, the idea of original sin, that we are a gross and fallen species, guilty for the sins of our ancestors and in need of external salvation, is extremely damaging. It has created a culture of guilt, abuse, and self-hatred, a mindset of self-victimization, which remains even as monotheism becomes less and less popular. From a monotheistic perspective, we are essentially evil, disgusting beings, not worthy of love, but lucky that God loves us anyways. And anything that contradicts the will of this God is immoral to the point of damning us for eternity, to an eternity of suffering and torture. Yet with polytheism, if we recognize there are also gods who wish us to have knowledge and freedom, who don't hold, us against, hold it against us, everything changes. Imagine where society may be if we did not inherently believe in things like original sin, but instead taught a philosophy more akin to each individual being a beautiful, discreet, unique, divine being, with free will and individuation held to the highest regard. To teach people that individualism and pride are evil, or that being their true self is wrong, or that they are disgusting and deserving of hate and only a god can love them? It's just wild how casually stuff like this is taught. It's no wonder we are so passive when abused by others, be it people in power, companies, even loved ones, when our culture... Cultural myth teaches that abuse like this is love and the highest goal. Let me quote Stephen Crane here, because of course I'm going to quote Stephen Crane. Quote, A man went before a strange god, the god of many men, sadly wise. And the deity thundered loudly, fat with rage and puffing. Kneel, mortal, and cringe and grovel and do homage to my particularly sublime majesty. The man fled. Then the man went to another god, the god of his inner thoughts. And this one looked at him with soft eyes, lit with infinite comprehension, and said, My poor child. Unquote. Along with how terrible it is that we teach people this idea of original sin, there's also no need to instill an extra sense of anxiety and dread in people about death, such as with suffering in hell, when there's already so much anxiety and dread inherent in human existence. Which, why, if God is the one all powerful, all loving God, makes more sense with polytheism again? Outside of basic morality, there are many valid ways for people to approach and live their lives, rather than one way which is so undoubtedly correct that doing something different means eternal suffering. You likewise do not need to incessantly fret about loved ones living their lives wrong unless they be punished forever, as long as they're just basically basic moral people, you know, just not harming others. Finally, some of the best evidence for the rejection of monotheism comes from monotheism itself, as we've already seen in a lot of cases. A lot of this has been touched upon, such as Yahweh being dishonest about his nature, manipulating and fear-mongering people, or just the historical act of a god demanding it be seen as the highest or only. The Bible acts as propaganda on behalf of this god, and it shows him to be a minor, jealous, manipulative, violent, mass-murdering sociopath, which is really nuts when you think about it. Usually that's how you try to make the other guy look, not yourself. There's an interesting quote from the book God Against the Gods by Jonathan Kirsch, which kind of talks about this one God trying to overthrow the idea of polytheism. Quote, the unmentioned and unmistakable subtext of these and many other biblical passages is that Yahweh, no less than Aten, is a failure. Repeatedly over a long and troubled history, the Bible can be read as a bitter song of despair sung by the disappointed prophets of Yahweh who tried but failed to call their fellows to the worship of the true God, end quote. Perhaps somewhat ironically, if we go back to divine experiences and a monotheist wishes to argue that all other gods but its are evil spirits which manipulate humans, this again opens up the possibility that that's what could be happening to them and not everyone else. Maybe there's one evil being trying to manipulate people and it's not literally every other of the thousands conspire together to you know, 
suppress humankind and oppress humankind. Maybe Yahweh is this being that you're so worried about, that they're so worried about. And with all the other problems and evidence laid out, perhaps this is really the most reasonable route for the theist to take. There really is a malevolent God or gods out there trying to force everyone to worship only them and to make everyone a slaves to its will. That's a very real possibility that should be consider con considered. And when it is considered, it's not a problem for polytheism at all, because why wouldn't there be evil gods who want all power for themselves? I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise to human beings. To quote Byron's Lucifer, because of course I'm going to quote Byron's Lucifer. Quote, I tempt none save with the truth. Was not the tree the tree of knowledge? And was not the tree of life still fruitful? Did I bid her, did I bid her pluck them not? Did I plant things prohibited within the reach of beings innocent and curious by their own innocence? I would have made you gods, and even he who thrust you forth, so thrust ye because ye shall not eat of the fruit of life and become gods as we. Were those his words? Then who was the demon? He would have not, he who, sorry, he who would not let ye live, or he who would have made ye live forever in the joy and power of knowledge, end quote. In the end, what we find ourselves with is a petty deity who has been trying to be king of the gods or the only god since Egypt, who lies about his nature, uses abuse and fear-mongering to manipulate people for worship, teaches people terrible things about themselves which are not true, calls for the death and destruction of those who will not bow, claims full credit for a world filled with evil and suffering, and produces propaganda which virtually admits to all this proudly, but is so arrogant and ignorant it confuses its own evil for goodness. This is not a being worthy of worship. So, a quick recap. <laughs> Polytheism is either superior to monotheism or safe from the problems of monotheism when it comes to the topics of divine experience, multiple religions, the nature of consciousness and the nature of the world and the problem of evil, the concept of chosen people, differing experiences of the afterlife, classical arguments for theism, original sin, suffering and hell, and because of what we might call the problems of Gnosticism. In the end, let me quote Crane one more time. Quote, I stood upon a highway, and behold, there came many strange peddlers. To me, each one made gestures, holding forth little images, saying, This is my pattern of God. Now this is the God I prefer. But I said, Hence, leave, we, leave me with my own, and take you years away. I can't buy of your patterns of God, the little gods you might rightly prefer. As always, I really appreciate the listen, and I hope you have either enjoyed or learned something. Preferably we, preferably we both. 